Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to today's event titled The National Security Threat of Authoritarian Corruption, How Dictators, Terrorists, and Criminals Abuse Free Markets. Thank you to AEI for hosting this event, and thank you to C-SPAN for covering it. Um, my name is Clay Fuller, and I bear the distinct uh, uh, honor of introducing myself on the AEI stage as uh, the Gene Kirkpatrick Fellow, or one of them in uh, Foreign and Defense Policy Studies here. I hold four degrees in political science, uh, one of them being a PhD from the University of South Carolina. And this event is a discussion of my latest report called Dismantling the Authoritarian Corruption Nexus, which is now available for download on the AEI website. Please read it, share it, let me know what you think. Uh, for follow-up, please see my AI Scholar page, or you can find me on Twitter at Clay R. Fuller. Uh, the American Enterprise Institute, just as a quick disclaimer, is a nonpartisan, nonprofit educational organization. The Institute takes no institutional positions on any issues, and the views expressed in this report are mine and mine alone. I'm going to make some brief comments on the report, then we're going to invite our two distinguished uh, discussants up here to the stage. I will give them a brief introduction, then I will sit with them, and we'll ask a few questions, and we'll chat about this topic of dismantling the authoritarian corruption nexus until about four o'clock, and then we'll take questions from the audience, and then we will dismiss right promptly at 4.30. So, what is this all about? I am a political scientist, right? This meaning that I study and explain how the political world works. It's not my job to offer my opinions. It's my job to explain how things work. So my work here stems from actual personal frustration, letting you know my opinions. I've been frustrated with being able to predict terrible outcomes in the world's authoritarian regimes looking around, seeing terrible things that are going to happen, knowing that they were going to happen, and then being frustrated by the fact that I am unable to do anything about it in my personal capacity. What are these things? Well, authoritarian regimes are involved in every single war. They're among the worst human rights abusers around the world. Authoritarian regimes tend to end just as violently or suddenly as they begin and they are generally horrific in how they deal with individual people and individual rights all around the world. In authoritarian regimes all around the world, corruption is a feature, not a bug. And all of this, wars, corruption, by the way, is terrible for markets anywhere especially in the long run. However, we have to recognize and know that authoritarian regimes around the world are sovereign states, but they are now interconnected with our markets and our politics in any number of ways that are quickly expanding, changing, and deepening. And so what this means is that it presents our policymakers with a core challenge, how are you going to go about addressing authoritarian regimes and authoritarian corruption without sacrificing our own values, without harming our own interests as free societies, or without harming our own capitalist markets? How are we going to do this? This is the core challenge. While we should not shy away from using our military and our economic power to defend our friends, and ourselves and advance our own interests, this deepening and expanding of integration with authoritarian regimes means that these traditional methods of dealing with national security threats, such as military interventions and sanctions, that tend to treat these authoritarian states as unitary, isolated actors, are going to become less and less and less successful over time. And on the converse side of that, liberal international institutions such as the World Trade Organization or the United Nations 
that tend to depend upon the dreams or the hopes of people for better action are going to continue to fall prey to illiberal actors around the world looking to influence them and bend them to their own will. So essentially, what I'm saying is that liberty needs a strategy. Democracy needs a strategy. The rule of law needs a strategy. And America especially needs a strategy for navigating the post-Cold War era of authoritarian regimes. To sum it up in a sentence, I would say we need to consolidate gains in liberty where it already exists and then lead by example. So consolidate gains where they exist and then lead by example. Now, you might say easier said than done, right? But it really is pretty simple. And what I've done is I've created a handy new concept, right, that can help explain why. The authoritarian corruption nexus. So the authoritarian corruption nexus is the growing convergence of licit and illicit state and non-state actors that facilitate and launder the profits of illegal activity reinforcing the strength and survival of authoritarian states and systems of governance all around the world. In other words, that's kind of a big definition, so in other words, authoritarian governments, what they do is they abuse their access to U.S. markets to prolong their own rule at home and gain strength. And in the meantime, what happens is that terrorist groups, international terrorist groups, transnational criminal organizations use these exact same methods and avenues to support and gain strength in their own activities. So the nexus is where we need to focus, but the problem is, is that it overlaps into free societies and free markets as well. So in the report, what I do is I characterize modern great power competition as not a clash of civilizations, but as a clash of governance systems, right? This is freedom versus authoritarianism. Corruption in this, however one wants to conceptualize it, is first the method through which authoritarians around the world seek to remain in office. It's the method they use to remain in office. And second, it's the channel through which authoritarians infect free countries and free economies with greater amounts of corruption. So to be clear about this, getting to the term kleptocracies, because I've written a bunch about this, all authoritarian regimes, in my view, are a form of kleptocracy. Now, in foreign and defense, foreign and defense, Questions, all of our enemies are authoritarian regimes, which are also kleptocracies. But not all authoritarian regimes are enemies. We have a lot of authoritarian regimes that we're friendly with, and that's okay. But that's no reason to simply turn a blind eye to the corruption that exists in those countries that's feeding this nexus. We need some adjustments, some recalibrations if you will. So the first aspect, before I get into the policy recommendations I put forward here, the first is that American foreign policy in general just needs to make a clearer distinction between the people that suffer under authoritarian corruption and the regimes and leaders that create those conditions for those people. In other words, China is not the enemy. The Communist Party is. Iran is not our enemy. The Ayatollahs are. Russia and North Korea are not our enemies. The Putin and Kim Jong-un regimes are. To better understand and understand these threats in a strategic, and as I've said many times, a non-violent manner, Domestically, what we need to do is look in the mirror, and what we need to do is we need to deal with the abuse of anonymous shell company formation in the United States, number one. Second, I would say give the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, a clearer mission. What are they doing in the world? Who are the enemies? 
What are they trying to do? Third, we need to deal with money laundering in a better, more systematic way in real estate, which is outlined in the report. Uh, fourth, clearly evaluate how the global network of foreign trade zones around the world work. There's some 3,500, 3, 4,000 zones around the world that we don't know much about how they work. We don't even have a singular definition uh, for them and understanding how, how that works with uh, all sorts of trade fraud and issues related to this. Fifth, I would say reevaluate the role of the Foreign Agents Registration Act in fighting disinformation campaigns, which I go into in the report as well. And then finally, give the private sector a greater role in anti-corruption efforts worldwide. This could be done fairly simply by amending the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act to punish the FCPA, to punish the demand side of bribery. Now, looking internationally outside of the United States, what I think is that we need to formalize the Group of Seven, so the G7, which was the G8 until we haphazardly kicked Russia out in 2014. The G7 should be made as a formalized institution only for established democracies which is what it essentially is now. It just not, it's not formal and it doesn't have a charter. And in that charter for the G7, I think we need to provide a clear mechanism for ascension to the charter, to provide an attractant for other countries to reform, to want to get into to the charter. And then we also need to have a clear method for expulsion, which is something that other international institutions lack, and we're seeing problems with that across Europe and, and other places. Um, lastly, I would say the Financial Action Task Force, which was created by the G7 in 1989, needs to find ways to refine its mutual evaluation reporting to look at how other countries are dealing with anti-money laundering, and also needs to step up to start focusing on trade-based money laundering, which trade-based money laundering is one of the least understood, most pervasive, worst elements of money laundering problems around the world that is right under our noses and we're not doing much about it. So in conclusion, I would say the rule of law and democracy are roads with no set end point. And I would say it's time to begin road improvements. And that's how we win this round of great power competition. Thank you. And now I'd like to call my two uh, distinguished panelists up and I will tell them I'll tell you all a little bit about them after, after they sit down, and then we'll sit down and have a, have a discussion. So uh, Dr. Bruce Bueno de Mesquita is the Julius Silver Professor of Politics at New York University, a senior fellow at Stanford's Hoover Institution, and a partner in Selectors LLC, a consulting firm that uses his game theory methods to address government and business problems. He is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and on the Council on Foreign Relations, a former Guggenheim Fellow and the 2007 recipient of South Korea's DMZ Peace Prize, among other honor honors. Dr. Bueno de Mesquita is the author of 21 books, including The Spoils of War, Greed, Power, and the Conflicts That Made Our Greatest Presidents with Alistair Smith, The Dictator's Handbook, Why Bad Behavior is Almost Always Good Politics with Alistair Smith, the Predictioneer's Game, Using the Logic of Brazen Self-Interest to See and Shape the Future, and my favorite, The Logic of Political Survival with Alistair Smith, Randolph Syverson, and James Moreau. He is also author of more than 140 articles and numerous pieces in major newspapers and the subject of feature stories in the New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, The Economist, U.S. News and World Report, The Independent, Financial Times, and a two-hour documentary about his political forecasting. He has a doctorate in political science from the University of Michigan and doctorates from the University of Groningen and the University of Haifa. So three doctorates. Welcome, Dr. Bueno de Mesquita. <laughs> and Dr. Daniel Twinning joined the International Republican Institute as president in September 2017. He leads IRI's team of nearly 600 global experts to link people and governments motivate people to engage in the political process and guide politicians and government officials to be responsive to citizens. Previously, he served as counselor and director of the Asia program at the German Marshall Fund on the of the United States, 
Before that, Dr. Twinning served as a member of the U.S. Secretary of State's plan policy planning staff as the foreign policy advisor to Senator John McCain and as a staff member of the U.S. Trade Representative. He has taught at Georgetown University and served as a military instructor associated with the Naval Postgraduate School. And he's also been a columnist for foreign policy in Nikkei and has served as an advisor to six presidential campaigns. Please join me in welcoming our guests. So welcome. Thank you. How'd you like my little, my little speech? I've been told I can be a little evangelical in how I, how I talk. Apologies for that. Evangelical in pursuit of freedom is a good thing. Yeah, OK. What's wrong with that? We'll start with that. I wanted to start by asking uh, both of you. You've had, you've had advanced uh, copies of the report and have had a chance to, to look them over. And I'm curious, from your own personal perspectives, we have two very different uh, uh, perspectives here on this. I wanted to see what, what you thought of it, uh, what you think is your, your key takeaway, its strengths, its witnesses, weaknesses. So I thought you raised extremely important questions that are understudied, not discussed enough. Uh, you started your talk this afternoon uh, with a, a list of uh, problematic types of people and, including autocrats and terrorists and drug dealers and so forth. And I thought you left somebody off the list um, that is fundamental uh, to addressing the issues of corruption that you raise in your report, uh, and that is we the people uh, and the leaders that we elect, um, mindful of the subtitle of the dictator's handbook, bad policy is almost always good politics. Corruption's not an accident. It's not a consequence of bad people, but of bad institutions, as, as you indicate. Um, and unfortunately, uh, as you also indicate, democratic governments exploit the opportunities that corruption provides, not to enrich themselves in the corrupt sense, but rather to make deals with autocrats. We'll give you money, we call it foreign aid, or we'll give you a, a pass on corrupt activity. And in exchange, you'll give us policy concessions. So we've extracted peace with Israel from Egypt, uh, in exchange for which we essentially pay the money. We buy the peace. Uh, we want the Pakistani government to pursue militants, and we give them money to pursue militants. These, these are good things. And we, so we face, as a people, in addressing corruption, a, a very tough problem. We want those policies to be conceded to us. And the governments in power need to pay off their cronies to stay in power. The way they make these concessions to us is we give them the money to pay off the cronies. So we have a difficult decision to make in tackling corruption, which is a disaster for the people in the countries that are most victimized by it, as you note. Uh, and that, that tension is that we have also to address how do we satisfy our constituents at home on important policy areas without essentially bribing corrupt governments to do our bidding. So that's, that's my concern. Um, I, I think on the normative side, I'm in agreement with everything in the report. It's thoughtful. It's pretty precise. Um, but we do have to address why we, the people, reward politicians for rewarding dictators. And that's something that we've been reluctant that's to do. It's a fair point. Before I respond, I'll give Dan a chance to, to say um, what he thinks about the report. OK. I'm here because I like the report a lot. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, there are a lot of people out there in America today who understand that we are in a great power competition, who understand that the world is much more competitive and adversarial than really at any point since the end of the Cold War. But they essentially think that the solution to that is 
the defense budget and building up American military power. Of course, that's got to be part of it, but that's part of it. Um, authoritarians are using non-military, non-kinetic instruments to corrupt, subvert, and assault open societies. Uh, by definition, you argue that there is an authoritarian corruption nexus because where there are lacks of checks and balances, where there is personalistic one-party control over state resources, you do end up with gross abuses, uh, all sorts of corrupt forms. But one key insight from your paper is that corruption in such a country does not stay in such a country. In fact, corruption is essentially laundered out of that country into the West. And so you argue quite persuasively that we have it in our capacity. It is in our wheelhouse to take on this issue of corrupt authoritarian actors who in great power form are working quite actively to subvert attack, weaken our leadership in the world and our own democratic practice at home. Um, Clay, you point out very compellingly that really we talk about these separate strands of threat against the United States and our way of life um, as if they were separate things. Mass migration, conflict that produces failed states and all sorts of pathologies, great power competition, competitors like Russia, China, uh, human trafficking, uh, all of these syndromes, in fact, emanate from a similar cause, which is governance that is corrupt and kleptocratic, despotic, etc. This takes different forms, obviously, in a country that is poor and weak than in one that is strong and vigorous, thinking about the difference between, say, Libya and China. Uh, but in fact, the blowback, the fallout, moves right to our shores. And so I really like your argument that fundamentally the solution to dismantling the authoritarian corruption nexus, the solutions lie in democratic capitalism. Um, you don't say it quite this way, but that free people and free markets go together, and that free people living under durable, representative, accountable institutions do not export their pathologies abroad in ways that threaten America and our interests. That free people living in well-governed, ordered societies, governed by rule of law, credible institutions, uh, actually look after themselves quite well, um, and that all of the challenges to us emanate from cases where that is not true. You also argue uh, that dependence on illicit transnational networks is the Achilles heel of corrupt authoritarians. The corrupt authoritarians rely on international non-state actors uh, to preserve their wealth, to launder money, to educate the, their children, their, uh, to park resources offshore of governing elites. And so ultimately, in a century that will prize technological innovation and human capital, which I think is the greatest resource of the 21st century, um, democracies, open societies should still have an advantage, a fundamental advantage, which is that our way of life is more attractive, our systems are more competitive, we innovate, uh, we care about we the people in ways corrupt authoritarians do not, but that we need to seize on some of those advantages and safeguard our open societies from these transnational networks that emanate from hostile authoritarian actors. Thank you, Dan. So I kind of, I, Bruce, I want to respond to, to uh, what you said and, and Dan and keep this, keep this conversation going. Um, I tried to make it very clear, as, as clear as I could in the report, that I don't think that democratic capitalism or democracies are perfect, or that, that there, there's, there's one graph in there that shows the individual observations of corruption, which corruption is a you know, terribly difficult thing to conceptualize or measure anyways. We're talking about it in a very abstract, me and, me and you are uh, in a very abstract way, but everybody talks about it in their own way. There's you know, trade-based money laundering, there's transactional bribery, there's grand corruption. There's all sorts of stuff to, to get at. But I, I tried to make it clear that, that you know, these groups of elites that will steal, rob, commit crimes in order to get the private goods that they need in order to keep remaining power exist in all countries, everywhere. That, that's just a human trait. But in authoritarian regimes, they are artificially culled and curated into a smaller group at the top. And this is what makes it worse there. Um, and, and then getting to what you said about, about us bribing 
off countries uh, uh, with foreign aid. I, I see that, and I've read all your research on that, and I, and I, and I love it. But I sort of think of it like, you know, uh, uh, peace in the Middle East is a public good, right? And so if you're, bribing, if you're bribing that off, that's actually, you know, that fits into the model for how a, a large winning coalition uh, uh, regime or a democracy uh, uh, works. So I would assume that if this carries on into the future and we solve some of these problems, then there would be you know, less need to, to do that. And, and I've worked some, and maybe you can respond to this with the transparency stuff that, that you've worked on with uh, Hollendorf, Rosendorf, and Vreeland, the HRV Transparency Index, looking at making information more credible. And so, and so is that a way that we could possibly uh, build more capacity in weaker states or to, to get more information out there? So more transparency in government compels governments to behave better. And more publicity about the absence of transparency in many governments is, I think, a critical ingredient in educating, for example, the American public, we the people, uh, on what the difficulties are in some of the places that we deal with. Uh, so that they will then increase the priority that they have for seeing better governments overseas as opposed to concessions at home. Uh, so I do think that's part of the recipe of cure. Uh, I think another part of the recipe that goes as well to your comments is the promotion of democracy, which we have never been good at, uh, and have never been sincere, in my opinion, about doing adequately, uh, because autocrats are much more willing to be compliant on policy questions with what we want in exchange for money uh, than our Democrats who have to represent what their citizens want. But the fundamental, as I see it, the fundamental problem in corruption, uh, which you alluded to, is Despots depend on very few people to keep them in power. If you depend on very few people to keep you in power, the easiest way to stay in power, the most efficient way to stay in power, is to let those people steal and be corrupt as long as they're loyal to you. So if we put more effort into making our commitments to dictators contingent mm -hmm. on their meeting some benchmarks. You want help from us? Fine. First, you deliver more free speech. You deliver more free press. You deliver a more competitive system. And we'll do more for you, as opposed to, we're going to do more because you promised to do that. And uh, well, we, I guess we have to give you more because you haven't fulfilled the promise. Um, you know, there is either a naivete or a uh, strategic uh, dissembling that goes on uh, that's very troubling. For example, a few years ago, um, in fact, Alistair Smith and I wrote on this at the time, uh, Hillary Clinton spoke about how great it was that Myanmar was becoming a democracy. And we said, oh, oh, oh slow down. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Autocrats have an incentive to act as reformers for the first two years in power as they learn where the money is. Because in those first two years, they were at more risk of being overthrown mm -hmm. as autocrats than as Democrats. After those first two years, the survival prospects of Democrats are terrible, and the survival prospects of petty dictators are excellent. So, that first two-year window is the opportunity to lock them into the kinds of reforms that right. you were talking about. And we don't exploit that enough. I think that's a great point. Uh, so sp speaking of fair trade practices or fairness in markets, Dan, I know the IRI just uh, recently put out a new report on uh, Chinese malign influence. And I, I, w I wanted to ask you what, what that's all about. Uh, give us a summary of, of how that relates possibly to, to what I'm talking about and what we're talking about here. And then I wanted to ask you guys uh, uh, both about, about China. What's going on? I mean, I said in my comments that China is not the enemy. The Chinese Communist Party 
is, is the enemy, meaning that they are the ones doing everything. Like I, I wrote a blog recently talking about how uh, billions of people out of poverty, right? That wasn't the Communist Party that did that. That was the Chinese people that did that. The Communist Party just allowed them to do it, to do it for themselves. But so the question is, is what, what I worry about with China is domestic stability. Um, what's going to happen? So, so, so when the USSR collapsed in 1991, surprisingly, seemingly out of nowhere, some people predicted it, um, but seemingly out of nowhere, it didn't harm us too much because we didn't trade with them, right? If that happens in China today, my worry is that that is a massive risk that we are wholly unprepared for if there's domestic instability there. And we tend to treat it as it's a monolithic, going to last forever, but we did the same thing with the USSR. And so, uh, you know, I'm curious where you guys uh, uh, fall on, on the China question. Okay, so just two quick points about China. One is that China's developmental, quote unquote, miracle is singular in scale, just because there are 1.4 billion Chinese. It's not actually singular in terms of China's growth trajectory. Mao Zedong destroyed the Chinese economy. If you wanted to destroy an economy, uh, the Mao Zedong playbook is a great one to follow. Um, the Chinese people rebuilt that economy once China began opening in the late 70s. And China's experience was replicated in an earlier era by Japan, by South Korea, by Taiwan, the Asian tigers, right? So China is the new Asian tiger. What's different about it is that what's happening is so big that it's displacing global economic and strategic balances. Small countries couldn't do that. Um, that's point one. Point two is there's a lot of talk, which I'd love to pick up in the discussion, about China somehow having a superior model because it has delivered all this growth and all this uplifting. It's created a middle class, the world's largest in some respects middle class, um, uh, without political liberty, right? Mm -hmm. um, Hong Kong, where two weekends ago, 25% of the entire population was in the streets. Two million people were in the streets protesting against an extradition law to mainland China. People in Hong Kong are as rich as people in Germany and France. I mean, Hong Kong is ri as rich as the richest part of Europe, yet they were still protesting the infringement of their political expression uh, as they saw it. So this argument that somehow being Chinese <laughs> makes you not value democratic freedoms and dignity is uh, untrue. We know it's untrue because we've seen Taiwan, a very flourishing, successful democracy, and now we've seen in Hong Kong a very flourishing, successful Chinese society uh, that does not buy the trade-off between the one-party state and economic growth. Uh, so that's on China, but more broadly on China in the world. Uh, America and Europe remain the world's largest foreign investors. So there is a little bit of hype around the Belt and Road and China's outward uh, economic expansion. That said, there is a lot of Chinese money washing around different parts of Asia, Africa, the Middle East, Latin America. Uh, and it's not new that there are these foreign investment flows. What's new is that they are Chinese. Uh, what's also new is the concept, the model. It's not led by the private sector. Uh, it's led by state-owned enterprises and, in some cases, private Chinese companies that are using state-provided forms of finance to go out and expand because China is at uh, capacity at home. Uh, a lot of these deals that China is doing, Chinese interests are doing in different parts of the world, do have the effect, whether intended or not, of corrupting local politics. There are a lot of backroom deals that are not uh, transparent at all, that in fact are very opaque that involve uh, trade-offs of countries' sovereignty, which is often why they are opaque backroom deals, because if people in these countries understood that their politicians were trading away sovereign rights to, say, a strategic harbor, a strategic port facility, a strategic piece of infrastructure, those people in that country might protest that form of Chinese engagement. So you were seeing a reaction to this uh, in many parts of the world now. Um, in fact, of course, Chinese money is not going to weigh, is not going away. Uh, it's a phenomenon in the world we are living in, and so our response at IRI, this report begins our engagement on it, is to help countries build the political resiliency, having strong and effective institutions so that they can then in turn have healthy relationships with China. Because where countries don't have strong and effective and open political systems, credible institutions, accountability, transparency, anti-corruption laws, uh, their politics are often subsumed by forms of Chinese financial and other engagement. So actually helping countries have effective open societies and strong competitive politics is part of uh, how they can protect their sovereignty in a world that is awash in Chinese investment. That's great, yeah. And I'm not, I think, I think, it's, I think it's wonderful. Uh, I like that you, your work, and I, I like that you point out 
uh, that there's a lot of hype put on BRI and, and other things. Um, it is something for us to watch, but it's the corruption aspect of it. It's the, it's the, it's the infecting corruption into other, into other states, developing states, and retarding their growth and their development um, in different ways. But Bruce, you've made a living off of predicting the future, so what, what, what is it you think about the future of, of domestic stability in China? Well, uh, I've actually written on that, as it turns out. I, I did a book in 1996 called Red Flag Over Hong Kong, uh, which was a bestseller in Hong Kong until July 2nd, 1997, when for some reason <laughs> it no longer could be found. Um, I, I think there's a significant probability that the uh, Chinese political system and the Communist Party uh, will implode in about 15 or so years. Uh, China faces, in my view, a fundamental problem, uh, which they will solve in a fundamentally bad way. Uh, the problem that they face is that in order for the party to survive in the mid to late 70s, they needed a new economic model. They brought Deng Xiaoping back from exile to implement that model, for which he was sent into exile. Um, and that model was to liberalize the economy. This has now created an interesting tension, a tug of war in China. Uh, in the coastal provinces, you have a lot of wealthy people. In uh, the non-coastal provinces, especially in the northwest of the country, uh, you have people who have enjoyed no benefit from the economic reforms. They are now demonstrating they want to participate. How do they get to participate in the reform? Well, the Chinese government has to, if they want them to be part of the economic miracle, they need to shift money to them. Where's that money to come from? by taxing more heavily the people in the coastal provinces who made the money. These folks don't want to be taxed more heavily to pay for non-Han people, like the Uyghurs, to become wealthier. So the government is in a tug of war. And the solution is political survival over economic survival, by which I mean that uh, the party will put itself, put, put its political survival ahead of the economy and this will result in 15 or so years in either revolution or coup d'etat. There will be an implosion. That will be very bad for, obviously, for the world economy for a while. The longer term effects will be good because China will become, I believe, a free society. With regard to people who naively believe that the Chinese have a better economic model, I'd like to make a very, two very simple observations that are closely related. China is the second largest economy in the world today. I like to ask my students, what was the second largest economy in the world in 1890? It was China, by many measures. What did China's economy do under various forms of autocracy? Swung hugely. Dictatorships depend on the wisdom, for want of a better term, of their despots for what economic policy looks like. So you might get lucky, and you might have a Li Kuan Yu who produces a very good economy, or a Deng Xiaoping. You might get unlucky and have a Mao Zedong or a Nikita Khrushchev who produces a or Kwame Nkrumah who produces a disastrous economy. What the difference is in economic performance between democracies and autocracies is not the average rate of growth, it's the variation the predictability in the average rate of growth. So democracies kind of chug along steadily, occasional setbacks, growing. And autocrats do big swings. Big swings are long-term, bad for markets. They're bad for citizens. This is not a good model of economic development. It's a disastrous model. There is a lesson, in my view, back to the theme of your report, that we could take from Deng Xiao, excuse me, from uh, Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping has cracked down on the corruption of his political opponents. He has not cracked down on the corruption of his inner circle. Mm -hmm. He has no problem with his relatives being fabulously 
I've written wealthy. about this, uh, culling the, yeah. the circle, yeah. We could at least as a starting place, satisfying our domestic constituents, crack down more seriously on the corruption of governments that are in any event our adversaries, are not helping us to be more secure, are not helping us to be more prosperous, are not jeopardizing our freedom. So, we, there's there's we, no shortage of corruption in the upper echelons yeah, of the yeah. Iranian regime. Right, exactly. Go, go after those folks who create problems for our citizens and for free people as a starting place. You know, Saudi Arabia is a pretty badly behaved government. It's a very corrupt government. But it is a friendly government. Russia is a pretty corrupt government. It's not a friendly government. It's not doing anything to advance freedom in the world. We should be doing more to target the leaders and their cronies, as Xi Jinping has done with his opponents, target our opponents. But does, but does that sacrifice our values as a... No, it advances, it advances our values because we have no need to do business with those right. folks. And we should do more than just pay lip service to they are a problem. We should make life difficult for them, not for the people, because you have it exactly right. Russia is not our adversary. The Putin government is. Mm -hmm. China is not our adversary. Xi Jinping's government is. Mm -hmm. The North Korean people, I'm sure, would love to be free and be prosperous. You know, Kim Jong-un is not so worried about how well they're doing as he's worried about how well he is doing. Instead of kowtowing to him, we should be tough on him. Mm -hmm. We should cut off his access to international banking. We should make it in the interest of others, others in powerful positions in North Korea to ask themselves, are we going down the right path? So, so I think this is, this is where I came up with the nexus aspect of it, it's because I think we've been trying really hard for a long time to cut North Korea off from, from banking access or from trading access, and we've been trying with sanctions to, to cut Iran off, uh, you know, and, and so what's happening is they, they find ways to connect. Right, uh, you know, China keeps trading with North Korea. Uh, China's still trading with Iran. Um, they're still moving goods all around the world, and they're doing it by relying on these product agnostic transnational criminal organizations who are increasingly contracting with terrorist organizations with non-state actors that can move across state borders and move this stuff. They're using technology in, in new ways to, to, to get around it. And so in looking at it long enough, I'm, I, I've come to the conclusion that you know, we've been trying to target them and they find, it's, it's, when we talk about corruption, there's always this, it's like squeezing a bag of sand or a balloon. Right? You, you try and clamp down on bad behavior and it just squeezes out in all sorts of other, other directions. And that's what's caused me to sort of uh, fall back on this leadership idea that we, should, that we should strengthen our position at home, be more transparent at home and clear about what it is that we're doing and lead the rest of the world to be able to come press down on this balloon of authoritarian corruption as uh, you know, free democratic capitalist states uh, around the world. Can I just react sure. to that? So I think you lay out an excellent kind of top-down US-led strategy for how to tackle this problem. There is also a bottom-up strategy through which to tackle this problem, and is based on the fact that people everywhere hate crooks who take political office and steal public funds. It actually doesn't have a lot to do with the United States. People in Iran hate it that the mullahs all run these side businesses that make them lots of money. People in Russia hate it, that Vladimir Putin owns the fanciest real estate in Russia, even though his salary is rather modest. He is worth billions with a B of dollars and has gorgeous palaces on all various Russian I think I've lines. heard it estimated at $160 billion. Yes, okay, so, uh, so personal network. we're having kind of an American conversation, which is entirely appropriate. We're sitting in Washington about what America <laughs> can do. But there is also a conversation to be had about how we can support good people in all of these societies who are actually even more angry about it because it's their money. They're living in these kleptocratic authoritarian states. They are poor while their leaders are rich. I mean, one way to figure out what kind of country you're dealing with is to decide whether taking political office makes you rich. In most democracies, it doesn't. Uh, 
Um, in these countries, it does. The key to power, often, the key to wealth is political power. So what can we do about that in a bottom-up way? And I'd like to just say something about the work IRI does around the world. We work in almost 90 countries around the world uh, with civil society, political party, other leaders uh, to try to level the playing field for good democratic practice, right? Because we think that actually is an American interest. Um, I would distinguish between closed societies and open societies. In closed societies, obviously uh, very difficult to access and operate. But uh, one can work with insiders to map kleptocratic networks to figuring out who's making money how uh, through political office. One can empower investigative journalists, even in these closed societies, to do data digging and to expose <coughs> what is going on. And uh, civic activists in these countries can shine a spotlight and organize around uh, these abuses, as for instance, uh, Navalny has done in Russia, right, um, uh, to spotlight the kleptocracy of the Putin regime. Uh, that's a kind of a closed, that's what happens in closed societies. In more open, competitive societies, but that are still transitioning, uh, really I think it's all about balancing executive power and creating strong political competition and having effective institutions. And so where parties, where political parties can compete in politics based on ideas, not personalities, uh, you can better constrain self-interested behavior because in theory politicians are running on a platform to deliver for citizens rather than running to take office for personal gain. So that's political party development. Uh, to check executive power to prevent the worst forms of executive corruption, uh, one can strengthen the legislature, the parliament, the judiciary, right? The legislative branch and the judicial branch are going to be the most effective intergovernmental checks on abuse of executive authority, just like they are in the United States. And three, um, really investing in open and responsive local governance, which is not about what politicians are doing in the Capitol and the prime ministers of the president's office, but really at that local government level. That's where citizens connect with governments most directly. And that's where kind of instilling a democratic culture in the citizens even if it's holding their city council accountable for that little puny city budget. Um, that is a way to address these issues in a bottom-up way. And again, uh, people in all of these countries care about these issues actually even more than we do. We're living in a rich, developed society governed by law and institutions. Many people are not, and uh, they are looking for ways to organize so that they can influence exactly the kind of things you're talking about in your report. I'm going to take this opportunity to, to explain sort of my take on this. I, th I think you're doing the Lord's work. I think it's wonderful. Um, but? And, and, it, and it's great. So <laughs> let me just keep complimenting you until I come with the perceived insult, but it's not an insult because it's not. Anyways, um, um, looking at the, how the NED works and how our whole democracy promotion thing, I've been thinking about this a lot since I've been out in DC and, and, and looking at how it works. And I think there's there's been, so, so I want to ask you about the election side of it, party building, legislature side of it, because in the authoritarian political institutions literature, it was only maybe, you know, less than 10 years ago that a book was written that said, oh, authoritarian governments have legislatures too, we should count those. Um, and we started doing that. And then, you know, there was a book on authoritarian, competitive authoritarianism, looking at uh, uh, voting in authoritarian regimes. And I've been talking to people a lot, like, Trying to show in North Korea holds elections every five years. They 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 hold they hold an election, and we have this. But there's not the party competition, so that stuff is all very important. But those are the closed societies that we can't get into. So so the ones that you're actually building capacity in, it's that's great. Um, but I'm thinking about ways to reach into those other ones, to the closed ones, right? And I'm thinking about the role that markets play in democracy promotion. I, I think we've sort of moved away from that in that whole in that whole era. So area. So I wanted to sort of get your take on on, on what should we be doing. And this is this is why in the report, you know, um, I wanted to put in there, you know, triple IRI's budget, um, but, but I didn't. I, I went with uh, amend the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act to give a, the private sector a greater role in anti-corruption efforts. Because while IRI and NDI and others are blocked from participating in deeply authoritarian countries, or they're not invited to, or they're limited in how they can, the private sector is there. You, those are their markets. We're all integrated, right? So if we can incentivize 
a greater role for the private sector actually promoting uh, uh, greater parties, great free and fair elections, better, cleaner governance, transparency measures. Is that an avenue that, that could be explored or is it being explored? Uh, I mean, there's an obvious self-interest for American companies in operating in rule of law societies where their property rights are protected, where there's dispute settlement in courts, if there is a commercial dispute, et cetera. Uh, companies, international, Western, Japanese, other democratic companies are taking inordinate political risks operating in a closed mm -hmm. society. And of course, many oil rich economies, for instance. And there can be a high reward for high risk, but it, it, right. Yes, so there's a broad interest. I mean, I think we're having kind of a Washington conversation about good public policy, but I think if you were an investment lounge in New York or in Silicon Valley, and you were a group of corporate titans, maybe some of you are, um, you would say, look, you will make more money in an open society that is prosperous and democratic and has rule of law. Uh, you may make a lot of money in a very short time in a corrupt autocratic society, but at any time that government can come in and seize your assets, mm -hmm. right? Or steal your intellectual property rights, as has happened in China to the tune of literally trillions of American yes. business dollars. And so you were assuming inordinate political risk. I think my question for you is, will companies operating in more authoritarian regimes, Western companies, actually put their business practices at risk, their short-term profits at risk, by advocating for things like greater rule of law and greater electoral transparency and accountability and that sort of thing? That's a good question. Maybe Bruce has something to say about it? Uh, I do. Uh, I also have something to say about uh, competitive legislatures, because they're, they're more complicated than we've made them out to be. Um, so I think it's correct that for many very large corporations doing business in lots of countries, uh, they would like open, free societies. It's also true that if they sacrifice business to try to promote open, free societies, they get squeezed out by Chinese firms and other firms that don't care about that. And so it's a, it, it's a problematic dynamic because while in the long run it's clearly in their interest, every long run decision is a set of small short term decisions and we keep our jobs or lose our jobs moment to moment, not in 10 years. Um, and so we have to make all these short term decisions that we hope will be long term maximizing. With regard to competitive legislatures, get a little bit complicated maybe. But um, it is in the interest of a, an autocrat, a dictator, to have either factions within his or her one political party or to have competing parties. The reason it's in the dictator's interest is you want the people who are helping to keep you in power to work hard for you. But if there's nobody else who might get rewarded instead of them, then they'll free ride. So it's in the interest of the dictator to have factions or seeming competitors so they can say, well, you want the rewards or you want the rewards. Who's going to work harder? You also want to know me? who's against you so you yeah. can repress and, them. And we can see this even in some normally described as democratic societies. Uh, I, I did a, a, a study a number of years ago uh, on why World Bank aid to Tanzania didn't have more of an impact. Uh, Tanzania is a multi-party system in which one party, the CCM, uh, wins about 90-something percent of the vote, wins almost all the seats, but they preserve a competitive system. They are always judged to have free and fair elections. They are free and they are fair in the sense that the votes are fairly counted. Uh, people can vote for multiple candidates. But they have structured the system so that the opposition is severely divided. The average constituency, at least when I did the study for parliament, had 10 political parties competing. It's a first-past-the-post Westminster type system, as in Britain, where you expect two parties because if you come in Third, you get nothing. If you're coming in second, you get nothing. You have to win. So the third party has an interest in backing the second party to get something. 
Um, but the government had promoted this. So the, the promoted 10 parties per, essentially, per constituency so that they could win on average with under 10% of the vote. They got much more because people bandwagoned once they knew they were going to win. So we have to look at not just whether there are competitive legislatures, but what the institutional structure is behind them. It's a much more subtle phenomenon than just the existence of multiple parties. Russia has multiple parties. I'm not worried about Putin not winning the next election. I am very confident that, that he will win. More importantly, I am confident that he has no doubt that he what about, How's he going to change the Constitution first? So that is, that is the difficulty. And I go back to the observation I made earlier. The, the great moment of opportunity for converting an autocrat into a democrat, well, there are two opportunities. One opportunity is when that person is newly in office. So they have a better chance of making it for, through the first couple of years by emulating a democrat. We could lock them in by providing rewards for their creating the things that lock them in to a democratic government, free speech, free press, freedom of assembly. Uh, Which necessarily means that they'll get kicked out by free elections yeah, eventually. Well, right? they may, although we have examples where that didn't happen. J.J. Uh, Rawlings, when he bankrupted Ghana, uh, converted the country into a democratic society, mm -hmm. ran, and won. Because um, he was then doing a good job. So, so that, that two-year window is one that we don't exploit, that we should exploit. There are plenty of places in the world where that two-year window is going to open up soon. I mean, right. uh, Raul Castro is very old. Yes, I know. They have a new guy. He's decoration. Um, we, we could make a real difference there. The other is when a leader is believed to be very sick. When a leader is believed to be very sick, sick the leader's cronies can no longer count on that leader to keep paying them because you can't pay beyond the grave. So when a leader is sick, they have a natural incentive to liberalize so that they don't face revolution. Right. We could step in at those moments. We, we monitor the health of leaders. We could help to turn those countries into a better direction, a less corrupt direction. Uh, and I add to the list of sickness very old age, because old age is a terminal illness. Um, you know, uh, Robert Mugabe has been forced out of power at 95. We have Similar not thing in Algeria. Yes, we, we have not exploited, yes, exactly. We have not exploited that opportunity to influence and transform mm -hmm. the government to have genuinely competitive politics. We have sat on the yeah. sideline and simply watch. That's a terrible policy mistake. Right. Can I say a couple? I know you want sure. to move to discussion, but just a, a quick point about elections. Of course, we understand when a country has a fake election what it's all about. This happens in places like Central Asia and I'm Russia sorry, I didn't mean in particular. Point. But um, there is also an interesting phenomenon where the leader of a one party state gets overconfident because. He lives in an information vacuum where all of his courtiers tell him he's hugely popular, he or she, with the people. And you've seen two examples of that really just in the past year. Um, actually, more, but just to give two examples. Uh, one is in Malaysia, which had a one-party system mm -hmm. for over six decades. And there was a nexus. There was an authoritarian corruption nexus between the ruling party that ruled for over six decades and kind of business elites, et cetera. Um, uh, the former ruling party had so gerrymandered the system that any, quote, election was almost bound to favor it. Somehow an opposition coalition got together, worked very hard, organized, and won that election. Yeah. And the first, one of the first acts of the new government was actually to freeze Chinese infrastructure yep. projects. And they right. opened the books and discovered extraordinary forms of corrupt practices powered not just by China, but also Saudi Arabia and other foreign actors. So that's one example. Another example is example. the Maldives, which is a small country, but very strategic, uh, given that it sits on those Indian Ocean sea lanes that are the energy superhighway of the world. Uh, a dictator there uh, who had won in an election and then basically eviscerated democratic institutions, democratic practice, uh, decided to hold an election last September 
90% of people voted and they voted him out. And they voted him out so resoundingly that there was sort of no way out. Others moved in to make sure that he did step down, others within the armed forces and the society, to observe that election outcome. And this new government, you know, always very troubled, these new governments that take power and have to dig out of various corrupt dealings by their predecessors. But the new government has a very different look. So just two examples of where elections have consequences, even in one-party systems. And the one I would look for next that really could be quite consequential is Venezuela. Maduro knows that if Venezuela had anything like a free and open election, he and his cronies would be long gone, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think the fear of many observers is that Maduro will be forced into a negotiation where his out is to hold an election. But as long as he sits in power and holds the reins in that election period, they will <laughs> tilt the playing field and steal that election because he cannot afford to have a free election. So in Venezuela, I think the US government unofficial position, as I deduce, is that should Venezuela announce a move towards elections to resolve this terrible stalemate that's produced more refugees than Syria in the absence of war. Over four million now, right? That you would need some kind of transitional government where Maduro was not in charge, some kind of technical process to oversee that election so that it actually reflected the will of the people because otherwise crooks will steal that election. Right. So I, I wrote about that with uh, untangling Venezuela's uh, authoritarian web. And we have the cover of the report is actually taken from the hyperinflation that mm -hmm. comes out of the corruptness of authoritarian rule. So we're going to begin transitioning to questions from the audience. I have, I have two general questions I'm going to ask the two panelists while you think of your questions. Uh, make sure you formulate your statement in the form of a question and make it brief and pre be prepared to state your name. Um, but before we do that, if we can get the microphones ready for that, I want to ask the two panelists uh, two more brief questions. In the report, I make the claim that ideology is not as important today as it was during the Cold War. Essentially, we don't have these big ism uh, fights and that, and that authoritarian isms are very dispersed and not connected. Do you agree with that? How, how would you each approach that? So I partially agree with it. Uh, if I may borrow from Karl Marx, Ideology is the opiate of the masses. I don't think ideology was important in the Soviet period. I think it was decoration to give people you would say that. an organizing principle. What was important was coming to power and staying in power however you could. That was, that was true when Xerxes was around, and that is true today and everywhere in between. So I think you're right, it's not important today. It never was important. Great. So I think in your report you say it's not an ideological contest, it's a contest of systems. Mm -hmm. So you're not saying there's not a contest. You're actually just saying it's, yeah. it's not driven primarily by Institutional high governance. Right. Yeah. Um, and so, yes, I, and I accept that. There is a contest of systems. Again, I think Americans have gotten unused to the idea of a contest of systems because uh, unless you were coming of age and very engaged during the Cold War, you have lived through a 30-year period in which essentially there hasn't been a contest of systems, right? Mm -hmm. And we're back to that. Now, I still think we hold <coughs> inordinate advantages, we in the free world. Um, we know where people, high-tech talent, wants to immigrate to. They don't all want to move to Russia or Iran. <laughs> Uh, we know uh, that the greatest source of human ingenuity is the innovative forces that are unleashed in a free and open society. Um, so we have many advantages, but leaders, corrupt authoritarian leaders uh, in great power competitors are waging their own campaign. And it's very interesting because we used to have these debates about do these do the leaders of Russia and China actually realize, do they think they are competing? Do they think there's a contest of systems? In different ways, both Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin just in the last few years have said exactly that. So, so even if Americans want to have kind of a, an objective value neutral conversation about geopolitics and great power competition, the leaders of Russia and China are actually positing a contest of systems and saying democracy is in decay. Uh, it uh, does not perform, it underdelivers. it's demagogic, it's full of populace, whatever you will, right? Okay. They are making a claim that their systems in different ways are superior, and so let's test that proposition. Yeah, I, th I, th I think standing up to it will, will make it uh, fall down, but that leads perfectly into my second question, uh, which has to do with the democratic decline, authoritarian resurgence narrative, 
uh, thesis, however it's going around. I've written a few things on this, looking at it, looking at the data, how this comes together, and, and whether, you know, if democracy is really in decline around the world or if authoritarianism is, is, is really resurgent. I tend to be kind of skeptical just from the view uh, that, that I look at. It. But part of writing this report came out of my concern that a lot of scholars that I look up to historians, uh, people of great prominence are very worried about democracy around the world and very concerned about it. And that concerns me that, they're, that they are concerned. And so part of writing this report was to sort of give a little oomph back to you know, the, the faith in democratic capitalism and how, how freedom and free markets work so that we can you know, sort of change that, that narrative. But I'm, so I'm curious uh, what you guys think about where democracy is. Uh, is, it, is it in a death spiral or are we on the way back? Or is, you know, how, how do you view this? So the way I think about it, uh, it's not in a death spiral. Uh, it's in a setback and it will oscillate back and forth. There's something simple to understand uh, that tells us about that cycle. That is the difference in the institutional interests of leaders, ordinary citizens and the disenfranchised, and the cronies who keep a leader or the winning coalition that keeps a leader in power. The interest of leaders is to have as autocratic a government that depends on as few people as possible. Those are the leaders who survive in power the longest and enrich themselves the most. It's great to be a dictator if you are the dictator. For citizens, their interests are best served by democratic governments that depend on a lot of people because then it's too expensive to bribe people. You produce good public policy. And for the members of the winning coalition, so to speak, the people a leader needs to keep them in power, theirs are the interests that will dictate that oscillation. Their interests look like the Nike swoosh. If you have a small coalition at this end and a big coalition at this end, and their welfare, their welfare is high when the coalition is small. It drops as the coalition gets bigger. As the coalition continues to get bigger, it rises and it passes this high point. So inside this bowl, you have revolutions, you have coups, you have instability, you have poverty and misery. If you cross this line, you cannot improve the welfare of your insiders except by becoming more accountable more transparent and have a more democratic government. Inside here, you can. So when there's a coup, for example, coup makers like to increase the ratio of how many people a leader needs to keep them in power to how many people that's drawn from. There are two ways to do that. Disenfranchise a lot of people and push this way, or enfranchise a lot of people and then need a lot and move this way. When they move this way, you get liberalization and you eventually get democratization. So that's the oscillation, and that oscillation doesn't end always in democracy, but it certainly doesn't end always in autocracy, and it leans in favor of democracy. Okay, that's a good point. So I have a couple, <clears throat> couple quick pieces to this. One is that uh, people power is at move. It's in, at, in motion in the world, in Hong Kong, in Venezuela, in Sudan, in Algeria, you've seen this flourishing of democratic activism, despite the so-called democratic recessions, right. that people are voting with their feet, including in the Arab world, for democratic political opening and democratic political change, right? Whatever we in our Western malaise are talking about, they're not really <laughs> listening because they want greater rights and dignity and opportunity. So that's we're one part of the answer. Two, um, this would be an interesting debate. I actually think dictators live in great fear and insecurity. So Maduro has Cuban bodyguards. He does not trust Venezuelans to protect his personal security in his own country. Think about it for a minute. He has foreign bodyguards. What does that say about him, right? China today has more people working in the internal security service than they do in their entire armed forces. China has the biggest armed forces in the world by number. There are more people in the Chinese military than the military of any other country, but there are more people than in the military protecting the regime from its own public, right? So I could go on and on with these sort of examples, but it's worth reminding ourselves when we say, oh gosh, Congress isn't exercising its appropriate function, or oh gosh, you know, Europe is looking a little messy politically these days, that there are different variations of good Twitter. and bad politics. Yeah. <laughs> so, such such yeah. and such happened on Twitter. 
Um, okay, so that's, that's a great point on the people power. Okay, so we're going to go, we'll take a question here. And we'll go to you second, right here in the blue shirt. Please state your name uh, and the question. Uh, hi, I'm Chris Orr. I am currently a, a policy analyst uh, contract and support of the DOD. A decade ago, I was a Customs and Border Protection officer at Los Angeles Long Beach Seaport, during which time I gained plenty of firsthand familiarity with, you know, via my inspection of uh, Costco and China shipping company cargo vessels of how, just how, you know, uh, the Chinese dictators abuse our open market system. Um, also, I got some familiarity with the uh, FinCEN uh, aspect that you, Clay, talked about. Uh, my question is primarily directed toward Daniel, though I certainly welcome inputs from Bruce and Clay on this as well. Since you mentioned how uh, illicit transnational criminal organizations are the Achilles heel, as it were, for uh, you know, authoritarian regimes, going back to China, uh, how big a role do the uh, so-called triad gangs and the snakeheads play in propping up the CCP, and what more can we do to uh, crack down on them and uh, stomp them with that proverbial Achilles heel, so to speak? Thank you. You want to take another one? You want to, you want to take a couple? Sure. Yeah. Let's take one right here. Uh, Is your name, where you're from, yeah. and a question? Hi, my name is Sana. I'm an economics student at Dartmouth and an intern at AI. Thank you for being here. Uh, so Dr. Twinning, I read your opinion piece on the Washington Post about Russia's meddling and uh, democratic assistance groups. So in the time that we live in with more tr like more trends and sentiments about a possible retreat from U.S. hegemony and also an increasing realization that our foreign aid might not be as effective or development aid. Uh, what do you see, broadly speaking, as the role of the U.S. government and different institutions in protecting democracy or addressing problems in the world when we see them? Is it a moral dimension or political strategy? Thank you. We have a question over here. About this gentleman right here at the blue shirt. Getting all the questions. Yes. Hi, yes, thank you. Colton Grelier. I'm a law student at Liberty University School of Law with International Christian Concern. The U.S. has many good tools of targeted sanctions, such as Global Magnitsky. And our narrative today, we've talked many about like Russia and China, but many of our strategic allies, such as Saudi Arabia and to a growing extent India, have deteriorating human rights records. How do we utilize targeted sanctions against individuals who may be part of strategic allies to the United States? I think we'll go ahead and answer these. Do you want to start? Yes. All right. um, I don't know a whole lot about organized crime in China. I mean, I, it seems to me that when we think about really a malevolent Chinese export now, the danger is this control society that has been built, this high-tech control society in China that has been built using these Orwellian tools of surveillance that the Chinese are now exporting to other autocracies to really help control their own citizens. And by the way, not just other autocracies. Um, I'm told that Belgrade, Serbia, uh, now has something like a thousand Chinese cameras in its central areas to do quote unquote crime prevention using facial recognition technology. But of course, those things could be used for other purposes as well. So I think personally, I worry a little less about kind of private illicit activity in China than we do about the strength of the Chinese state that allows these extraordinary forms of social control that are then exported to other countries. Um, on the US role in supporting democracy in the world and the development budget, so my predecessor who ran IRI is now running USAID, Mark Green. Um, and uh, so he is in charge of this extraordinary development budget. Uh, I don't want to speak for him, but my impression is that I'm not sure we're spending our U.S. development budget, which is a tiny, tiny fraction, tiny, tiny <laughs> fraction of the broader I mean, U.S. budget. Tiny. <laughs> um, it's very tiny, but it's meaningful in the world that we're spending it in all the right ways. I mean, I think the way you make the case to the American people about the development budget and supporting democracy and other good causes is that, A, it's the right thing to do. We had our founding principles in our country, and we want to help other people enjoy the same rights and freedoms that we do, just as we got help from abroad. Uh, when we established our own constitutional republic. Uh, that's one. And then two, uh, it's much less expensive, it's much cheaper 
to help build decent societies than it is to try to inoculate ourselves against the violent spillover when those societies go haywire. So to give an example that we haven't talked about much, Central America today, I mean, we're having a great debate. We do have an immigration crisis on our southern border. We have a whole lot of people coming out of broken gangster societies uh, in Central and South America, including Venezuela, uh, flocking to our shores. And we're having a debate about preventive measures to protect the border. Um, in fact, I would argue that addressing the problem at the source through some rule of law and decent governance and human security would be much more cost effective. So this is one of the things I've brought up in the report is foreign trade zones. And I've spoken about this before. They're called free trade zones in Central America. This is how you deal with a lot of the stuff with the criminal organizations as well. If these people have jobs doing licit legal things, they're not going to immigrate they're not going to be committing crimes if they have an incentive to make a profit in a, in a in a legal way. But furthermore, with 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 the with the Chinese ones, I, th I think you know making it within the government's own interest to take care of them themselves. It, it already is right. So with China, you could look at fentanyl, right? Most of the fentanyl is responsible for 76,000 American deaths in 2016. Was manufactured in China and it was smuggled out of the country into Mexico or other places and or mailed through the UPS system. There are gangs making money off it. The, they're making money. So it's all about that profit. Motive. If, you, if you're concerned about these gangs and what they're doing, it's, it's about the profit motive. Same with immigrants, same with, same with development. Um, they're seeking, they're just like everybody, they're just like all of us. They, they want to make a profit. But some people are more risk acceptant and they tend to do criminal activities and seek of that profit. You give them opportunities to do what they want to do for a legal buck, they'll do it. Um, and yeah. I, I want to go back to the foreign aid, because I, I really yeah. don't want us to lose sight of how much our political interests dictate how poorly foreign aid money is used if we're interested in promoting democracy. It is true that foreign aid is a tiny, 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 tiny mm -hmm. amount of money. But when you consider that most foreign aid goes to dictators and not to benefit the people in their countries. William Easterly, my colleague at NYU and an economist at uh, the World Bank, has demonstrated this amply. Uh, we have to understand that it's a tremendous amount of money when it's going to a small group of people in each of the recipient countries. It's being divided over a very small pool. A, I hope I'm remembering the statistic correctly. I believe it is the case. Uh, it's in one of my papers, a 1% increase over average per capita foreign aid increases the survival prospects of a, an autocrat by 32% per year. That is, they have a one-third better chance of being in office next year than they would have had without that small increment over average foreign aid. That's what foreign aid is buying. And they are giving us policies we want in exchange for that money. So it's not so easy to translate foreign aid into a democracy promotion tool when the sad reality is that if you ask the question, who, four questions, who gives aid? How much do they give? Who gets aid? And how much do they get? The answer is that it's an equilibrium. It is not the case that we and other countries, European countries, OECD countries, are giving foreign aid to dictators not realizing that they're going to steal the money. We understand that they're going to steal the money. That is the implicit deal. You get the money, we get the policies we want. So, so if we ignore that, we are going to be in the wishful thinking world and get it wrong. So Bruce, I've thought about this a whole lot, and then I'll get to the global Magnitsky uh, uh, question. Uh, I proposed before that one way to do this is to actually get measurable results, right? There's conditionality, but there's political ob obstacles to that. But, but so I, I've proposed that you could spend that money on national statistics offices in countries in order to get better information that you, than you could measure, which would tend to have... So many years ago now, uh, we had the Millennium Challenge Grant. Yeah, yeah, and the Millennium yeah. Challenge Grant was designed to reward countries that had better human rights and better democratic governance mm -hmm. principles. And for the first several years of the Millennium Challenge Grant, we spent something like 3% of it because 
the yeah. folks in the State Department who were charged with this problem at USAID and at policy planning could not agree on quantified standards for measuring human rights and governance because it meant denying money to governments that were doing things we wanted. It wasn't because they didn't know how to do it. It's not because there aren't measures out there in the literature. It's because it ran into exactly this. We'll have another problem. panel on that uh, uh, very, very <laughs> soon. Getting to wh what you do, and I'll call for more questions in a second, but for uh, using Magnitsky sanctions against people, of course, with friendly authoritarian states, that's always going to be a diplomatic challenge and a problem. But with authoritarian ones, it shouldn't be that big of a problem. Uh, Iran, for example, bought a skyscraper that I outlined in the report uh, in downtown, downtown New York. It took uh, DOJ something like seven or eight years to investigate to find out who, who owned it uh, to go through it because of these shell companies. That's why I come back to the anonymity of, of shell companies and dealing with transparency in that era. So there should be a way for when we do make that bold step of sanctioning a human, human rights abuser, especially one that's an adversary that might threaten national security of the United States, we should have a way to find out what it is that they own. There's a government accountability report from 2017 where they went through and found over a thousand high security leases that we couldn't figure out who owned them. So the implication out of that is that the GSA is renting FBI and HSA buildings to our agencies that are investigating China or Russia that might be owned by people in China or Russia, but we don't know. And that's sort of a, a problem, uh, I, I would think. Um, if I could just, since the two countries you gave as examples were Saudi Arabia and India, and in another life I was an Indianist, um, let me just observe that lumping those two together seems to me wholly inappropriate. Um, India has one of the world's better human rights records. India is not an autocratic state. India is a competitive democracy. It has been a competitive democracy at least since 1967, uh, when the Congress party faced its first real threats to power. And one could argue that it was a democratic country much earlier than that from its beginning. Um, you may not like some of the policies that the Indian government adopts. And this goes exactly to the point I'm making with regard to aid and bribing dictators. One of the reasons that democratic countries, despite their rhetoric, in fact, in their behavior, seem reluctant to promote democracy is that the people in another country may elect a government whose policies people here or in Britain or in France or wherever don't like. The nature of democracy is that the people who get elected in a democracy must do what their constituents want, not what our constituents want. So when we give aid to democracies, we have to give them more money to get smaller policy concessions because they have to charge more so that they can reward their constituents in other ways. So Saudi Arabia is an entirely different picture from India. Saudi Arabia does not have a good human rights record. Saudi Arabia does not have a competitive government. Saudi Arabia is doing what the king and the royal family want. The Indian government is doing what their voters want, which may not be what we want, but it's what their voters want. So we have time for a few more questions. Let's take this one in the blue shirt here. This one the tie here. I'm John de Blasio. Um, and I uh, uh, run a development firm focused on USAID with our main client being the Office of Transition Initiatives. Uh, so the question uh, is really uh, within the USAID development and within the State Department and DRL and other organizations that are focused on helping transition to democracy, um, how are we doing? Uh, these organizations have come a long way, particularly OTI, which was founded in the late 90s or mid-90s, to help Eastern European governments move from um, autocracy to democracy. And they arguably had a great influence on the, the democracy wave that occurred. Um, that's the question. I just would add as a comment, uh, 
uh, Bruce, I read your book. I loved it. I read both of them. Uh, and the chapter that I reflected on, which I felt was weakest, was the, the chapter on the influence of foreign aid, because I think it broadens the category of foreign aid such that the correlation is very hard to tell. So um, I just we'll, bring We'll that have out. another panel on that one also. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but the question goes back to the policy changes that we've made as a government in instituting assistance programs to assist with transition. How are we doing and how can we improve them? Uh, let me observe with regard to the book that uh, there are technical papers where all the evidence is very sharp. Um, I think USAID is a great organization. I spoke there a few years ago about us being a great organization with great people who are really well-intentioned. How well are you doing? So-so. Uh, why, why is that? Uh, so there are several reasons, uh, as you will know better than I do. Um, the Department of Defense often will raise the concern security when you want to do something that they, they don't like. Um, more importantly, very few governments are transformed through aid or through uh, any sort of foreign diplomatic or economic effort. Governments are transformed overwhelmingly into democracies from within, not from outside. So you can help, but you're never going to be having a huge impact. And you know, we, we, we see, as you've mentioned, the world has backslid on democracy. Your efforts haven't backslid. It's just the domestic leaders like dictatorships. And so finding a way to get the people's will to dominate is very tough without their doing it themselves. We have one more question here. And we'll take one in the back, also right here with a red tie. Okay, yeah. Hi, my name is Daniel Di Martino. Uh, so I'm interning here in DC at the Tax Foundation now, but I'm from Venezuela, so I have a vested interest in this, right? Um, so a big reason authoritarian governments survive is because of the help of other authoritarian governments. And I completely agree with the report, Clay, and with all your uh, recommendations here, but how can democracies stop collaboration between state actors, not just private actors, things like Russia loading Venezuelan oil in their international waters so that they can avoid US sanctions and other things in Uganda with gold, uh, things like that. I'm sorry to you that we have 15 seconds left to answer this. So, <laughs> so who, who wants to take a take Can a, I just, I wanted to follow up, but you actually preempted me on your point about kind of the limited value or the limited role of foreign assistance. The world has changed so much. So IRI has been in business for 35 years. And certainly after the fall of the wall in 1989, the playing field was open for the West broadly to go in and try to help democratic societies, often new ones, stand on their own two feet, right? And then there was a big debate in the West about should we engage, should we quote intervene, including in the civilian sense, not just the military sense, or should we not? That world is gone. Everywhere I go in the world, I bump into Russian interests and Chinese interests and Iranian interests and Turkish interests and Saudi interests and Indian interests, right? That includes in Africa, that includes in Latin America. You mentioned Russia in Venezuela. By one count, there, there, I mean, the number of countries, quote, intervening in Venezuela, uh, America is not on that list. I mean, the countries that are actively intervening on the ground in Venezuela include Cuba, Russia, China, mm -hmm. Iran, right? And so I think this conversation about sort of how we use foreign assistance, how we are strategic in it needs to reflect the fact that all these actors who have very different interests are actively engaged. This and if is the we, nexus. If we don't, in, I mean, there's a question about how we intervene, right, in the civilian sense, not the military sense. But if we say, well, we're just going to stay home and let those societies solve their own problems, the Russians and the Chinese mm. and the Iranians might not let them solve their own problems. And I think it's just a different landscape. So I did a paper a few years ago on uh, competitive aid giving, where there's more than one donor, exactly this problem. Uh, the, the short story of that is, there are two consequences when you have competitors for the outcomes that you want. You pay a higher price to get a lesser outcome. In the case of, uh, of Venezuela, uh, in my view, too much focus has been placed on trying 
raise a revolution, which is very risky and very difficult. What is needed in Venezuela, in my view, is for the military leaders to conclude that they are better off not backing Maduro than they are backing him. To me, the likely outcome in Venezuela, if the cards are played right, is either a coup, mm -hmm. and as I said, when you get coups, you can move more likely tilts in the more democratic direction, um, or for them to back the revolution. As long as they're getting paid, essentially by the Russians, and by the Cubans, that's not going to happen. So um, we have to find a way to find a component, a significant component of the general staff that understands that their future is brighter without Maduro. Yes. We have not been doing that. Or at least, right. well, if we are, we're not doing it publicly. We're out of time, everybody. Please join me in thanking our guests. Thank you to AEI. Everybody be safe, stay dry. <laughs>